Hello, Westover. It's so good to be with you once again. We're so glad that you've joined us. We are continuing a series entitled Kingdom Come. For you see, we want to see God's kingdom come here on earth and be established here in our life. We actually get the title of this series from a passage in the book of Matthew chapter 6. Jesus was talking to some disciples and some fellow followers, and they were asking, how should I pray? And as you know, Jesus started off by saying, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And then he goes on into verse 10, he says this, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I truly believe that God just doesn't want to have us experience his kingdom when we're in heaven, but he wants us to experience his kingdom here on earth, here and now. And I believe that many of us, we need to experience God and his authority come rule in our life and in our affairs. And so I just wanna invite you as we continue this conversation to say to God, I need to experience you in this mighty, mighty way. As I was preparing, I began to think about uh, movies that I really like. And as some of you know, I love epic movies. I love epic movies. I love Braveheart. I love Gladiator. I love the Star Wars vid movies. I love the, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I, I love all of those epic stories. And there's something about those stories that stirs something within me. And I began to think about another story that I really like that comes from the, from the movies. And it's the story of King Arthur. For you see, King Arthur, he lived in Camelot and he had knights. And those knights would sit around a round table and they would talk about how they're gonna work together to conquer and to protect the land. But one of the things that I noticed about King Arthur's table is that the only people who were welcome there at the table were people who had pledged their allegiance to him. No one else was welcome into that table and into that space. And I began to think about God. And what I realized is that God is kind of like King Arthur. If we're willing to pledge our allegiance He's willing to give us a seat at his table. But his table is much larger than King Arthur's. It's much larger and it can accommodate each one of us. And so today I've titled our conversation, Welcome to the King's Table. Welcome to the King's Table. God wants to welcome us to his table. In fact, when we look at Psalm chapter 23, verse five, it says this, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, my cup, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. God wants to see that we're gonna set a table for him, that we're gonna get the opportunity to see him work and move. And so with that in mind, I wanna invite you to join me in 2 Samuel chapter nine. We're gonna look at the story of two friends, David and Jonathan. David, he was a shepherd. And all of a sudden, he makes friendship with Jonathan. And the thing that's interesting about this story is that David and Jonathan should have been enemies. They should have been enemies because Jonathan was the, ki was the king's son. He was the son of the king at the time, King Saul. But I want you to look at this story, and I want you to pay attention to how God works in this relationship. So fast forward a couple years, King Saul is still on the throne. And then all of a sudden, a warring tribe, the Philistines come in and they kill King Saul and all of his sons. And then right at that moment, King David becomes the king. He ascends to the throne. But what happens in all of that is that as King David is going along, he's been the king for a little while and then all of a sudden he remembers his friend Jonathan. And what's interesting about the story of David and Jonathan is that even in spite of the fact that they were supposed to be enemies, Jonathan pledged his allegiance to David because he knew that David was gonna be the king. But as David was sitting on the throne, he began to think about his friend Jonathan and the pledge they had made to, together to be friends forever. And so I wanna invite you to join me in 2 Samuel chapter nine, verses one and following. Open up your Bible, open up your Bible app, open up your Westover app, let's look together. Verse one, David asked, is there anyone still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Verse two, now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. Verse three, Ziba answered the king, there is still a son, Jonathan, he is lame in both feet. Verse four, where is he? The king asked. From this story, we're gonna look at it a little bit more in, in, in a little closer detail, but from this story, we see an insight 
about King David, but we also get an insight about how God works with us. And here are three truths that I want to share with you about the king and his king and the king's table. The first truth is this, is that the king, he will search for you. The king, he will search for you. Now, growing up, I grew up in a really rural area, and one of the things that we would do, we didn't have a lot to do, is that we would play games outside. Now, for those of you watching, you kids and students, you may not be able to relate to that. But when we were younger, we didn't have anything to do, so we would go outside and we would play, and one of the games that we would play often was hide-and-go-seek. Now, the rules of hide-and-go-seek is someone is it, they're the seeker, they go out, and they're looking for all of their friends. They have to count to 100, and then they have to go find their friends. And the first person that they find is it the next round. And the last person that they find is the winner. They're the winner of the round. Well, one day, my friends and I, we were out back behind my dad's clinic, and we were up in a little hill, and we were playing, and we were running around. We'd already played a couple rounds of hide-and-go-seek. And so I went, and I hid, and I waited five minutes and 10 minutes and 15 minutes, and no one came to find me. And about 20 minutes later, I finally walked back down to where we were all meeting And I noticed that all of them were sitting down drinking Gatorades. And I said, where were you guys? And they said, well, we didn't know where you were. We thought you went inside. So we stopped playing the game. In that moment, I felt like a winner. But I also felt like a loser because no one came to find me. No one came to tell me that the game had ended. And I was thinking about all of you that sometimes in life we feel. We feel like we're overlooked or that we're forgotten But the truth is, is that God will search for us. God will search for us. For some of you today, you feel like you're in a relationship with your spouse or a significant other and all of a sudden they've lost interest. Maybe you were the go-to person at your job and the boss would always tap you on the shoulder for a project, but all of a sudden you feel like he's not looking for you anymore. For others of you, you have been in a friendship with someone and you've been friends for months or even years and all of a sudden something happens and now they've dropped you and you don't know what happened. They've ghosted you and you don't know what is going on. Well, I want to reassure you today that God is always looking for you. He is always seeking for you. He is always looking to find you. In fact, Jesus tells us a story in Luke chapter 15. He talks about a shepherd who had a hundred sheep and one of the sheep runs off. And the Bible tells us that the shepherd leaves the 99 to go find the one. This is what it says in Luke 15, 7. I tell you that there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not repent. The truth is, is that God will go seek you. He will go looking for you. He will hunt you down to give you the very best of himself. He wants you to experience relationship. He wants to pull you back in. The shepherd king will leave the 99 to find the one every single time. God in heaven, he will leave the 99 to come and find you. So I don't know where you're at today. Maybe you feel like you're far away from God. Maybe you feel like you've been forgotten or overlooked God is coming after you. He is seeking you. He wants relationship with you. Ezekiel 34 verses 11 and 12 says this. For this is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As the shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so I will look for my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. What I love about this verse is it's telling us that God is going to go seek for us, but he's also going to look for us from the places where we're scattered on days of clouds and darkness. Now, I know some of you, you feel like you're in a day of clouds and darkness. God is coming after you. He is seeking after you. He is looking to go find you because he wants relationship with you. And so today... I want you to know that he's looking for you. And I want to give you an opportunity to be found by him. It's by deciding to say yes to Jesus. And at Westover, making a decision to follow Jesus is as simple as ABC. It's saying, A, I acknowledge that I need Jesus. B, I believe in my heart that him dying on the cross was enough to pay for my sins. And C, I'm going to confess with my mouth from my heart that I need him to save me. 
And so I'm gonna extend an opportunity to you. Maybe you're here and you're watching and you feel like you're without hope. Maybe you feel like you have been in a game of cosmic hide and seek and you can't seem to see where God is. Well, he's looking for you and he wants relationship with you. And so if you're in that place, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, I need you. I feel lost. I feel forgotten. And I need to see you as the shepherd king looking for the one, the lost one, looking for me. I confess that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. And I ask you to save me, to seek for me and to save me, to give me a hope and a future in these dark days. In Jesus' name, amen. If you made that decision today, if you said that prayer, I wanna congratulate you. God has found you today. You have found him. And I wanna invite you to text the words new life to the number on your screen or click on the link. We wanna hear from you. We wanna encourage you. We wanna help you advance in your walk with Jesus because he is searching for you. But he just doesn't wanna find you. He actually wants to advance you, which leads me to the second thing, the second truth about the king and his table. Number two, the king, he will elevate you. He will elevate you. Verses five through eight say this. So King David had him brought before, brought from Lodabar. When Mephibosheth came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him. You will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? The truth is, is that Mephibosheth was in a place of isolation. He was in Lodabar. And most biblical scholars tell us about Lodabar that Lodabar was a place that no one wanted to live. It was a ghetto. It was a place where people would go to be forgotten. In fact, the word Lodabar means a place of no pasture, no word, no communication. It was a place where he was cut off. What we need to remember about Mephibosheth is that he was a prince at one time. He was the grandson of the king. He had all of the king's riches available to him. But in one moment, because his grandfather and his father passed away, everything was gone. He had to go live with someone else because he was lame and he was crippled. In fact, I started thinking about another movie that I watched when I was growing up, and it's the story of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. I grew up watching that movie, and if you remember that movie, just put a hand up in the comments. Let us know that that's a movie that you used to watch as well. But there's one scene in that movie where Rudolph and his friends, they go to this island, the island of misfit toys, the island where the toys that weren't wanted, where they were forgotten, were sent. They were banished. They were sent away. And Rudolph and his friends are having a conversation with one of the toys there, and that toy is telling them the story about how they're forgotten, and they're just waiting for someone to love them and to come find them. And I was sensing in my heart that Many of us, we feel like we're on the island of misfit toys. We feel like we've been forgotten. We feel like we've been overlooked. We feel like no one is looking for us, that we're an outcast, that we're set apart, that we're, we're forgotten, that we're not worth anything. But the truth is, is that God wants to elevate us. For you see in this passage, Mephibosheth comes in probably very slow and he bows before the king and what you need to understand is that Mephibosheth was crippled in both of his feet. So bowing down low was a hard thing, but he knew that as the grandson of the former king, he had to go before the throne of the king, not sure how the king was gonna respond because the king had the right to take him out. But what does King David do? He says, stand up, Mephibosheth. Don't be afraid. You're gonna sit at my table. The truth is, is that God wants to do the same for us. He wants to elevate us. He wants us to fully experience 
him. But often we have to get over this mindset that we are a dead dog, that we are overlooked, that we don't have worth, that we don't have value. And I know some of you are facing that in your own mind and heart. You feel like I can't go to the king's table because I'm not worth it, because I'm lame and I'm broken. I've got things in my life that I can't overcome. Well, God is saying, I'm willing to overlook those disabilities. I'm willing to look overlook those struggles. I'm willing to overlook the things that you think are a barrier between you and me. All you have to do is come to my table. In fact, David, he struggled with this idea as well. In Psalm 8, 4, he says this, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. King David had this question for God, but here's the response, is that when we come before the king of kings, he wants to elevate us. Even though we bow in reverence to him, he's saying, You don't have to be afraid. I'm a good father. I'm a good king. I'm going to elevate you. I'm going to take you beyond your disabilities. I'm going to take you beyond your struggles. He wants to elevate you. He wants to take you out of low debar. He wants to take you out of the place of desolation, the place of isolation, the place that you've put yourself because you don't feel like you're deserved to sit at the table of the king. Well, the king is inviting you today. He's saying, If you're willing to say yes to a relationship with me, you have a spot, you have a seat at my table. So number one, the king will search for you. Number two, he will elevate you. And number three, the king will restore you. The king, the king of kings, God in heaven will restore you. Verse seven says this, Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Verse 11 says this, so Mephibosheth ate at at David's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. And even still, he was lame in both feet. God wants to restore. He's searching for you because he wants to elevate you. He wants to lift your chin. He wants you to see that he is good and that he is faithful, even in this situation, even in this season that you're facing. But he also wants to restore some things to you. As I said, Mephibosheth, Before his grandfather and his father passed away, he was a prince. He had land, he had title, he had prominence. But in one moment, all of that went away. And in those times, what would happen is that the ruling king would then absorb and assume all the land that belonged to the former king. But King David remembered the promise that he had made to Jonathan that he would always take care of his family because Jonathan had promised to always take care of King David's family. They had made that covenant and that oath. And because of that, God prompted King David to say to Mephibosheth, I'm gonna give you back everything that belongs to your grandfather, all the land. And in fact, I'm gonna put Ziba, King Saul's servant, in charge of that land. And all of the proceeds that come from that land will be there to take care of you. But you, Mephibosheth, you, you're going to sit at my table. So Mephibosheth didn't even live in the land where, where he was entitled to that land. He actually lived close by to the king. And I began to wonder, what if God is saying, you're far away, but I want to bring you close. I want to bring you close. I want to bring you into my presence. I want you to experience my protection. I want you to experience my provision. God wants to prepare a table before you. Listen to what verse seven says. I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul. God gave him a seat. God restored, but he also gave him a seat at the table. Now, many of us, we feel like we're kids at the kid's table. We feel like we're grown up and we deserve to be at the adult's table but we're at the kids' table where all they serve is PB&Js and 
Maybe some of you enjoy PBJs, but most of the time, if they're steak and potatoes, that's what you want. You don't want PB&Js. You want something that's upgraded. Many of us who are here today, we feel like we're at the kid's table. We feel like we're left out. What God is saying to us is I have a seat at the table for you. You and I, if we say yes to God, we have a permanent invitation at the king's table. You're invited to the king's table. But here's the best part, is that when you say yes to the king's invitation, he makes you a VIP. I want to leave this thought with you. If you RSVP to God, God will make you a VIP. If you RSVP to God, he will make you a VIP at your table and all that the king has and all that he is will be made available to you. You'll be able to sit close to him. You'll be able to experience him. And in that process, in that interchange, he's gonna restore to you the things that have been stolen from you. Some of you, some of you, you've just lost a job. Here's the good news. God is saying, I'm gonna restore that to you. Some of you, you feel like you've lost your marriage. God is saying, I'm going to heal and restore that as well. Some of you, you feel like you've lost everything. You feel like you've lost in uh, relationships. You feel like everybody's gone. God wants to restore that to you. Here's the good news. God will restore what was stolen and repair what is broken. God can and will restore what was stolen and repair what is broken. I'm reminded by Psalm 23, verse 5, that says this, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. To give you some context, King David, he was, he was a shepherd boy before he became king. But one of his talents was that he could play the harp. And King Saul, when he was king, he learned about that. And so he invited David to come in and to sing songs and to play music. But there came a time when David wasn't welcome at the king's table. He was pushed away. That's why David wrote this verse. He says, you prepare a table in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, which reflects that God was anointing him as king. And when he prepares a table for you in the presence of your enemies, he just doesn't provide for you. He gives you overflow blessings. And so some of you, you feel like you've been done wrong, whether in a relationship or in a job. God is saying, I'm going to heal what is broken. I'm going to restore what is stolen. And so I sense in my heart for this moment that some of you are in that place. You feel like all is lost. And if you're there in that place, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. God, I pray right now for your people. They feel overwhelmed. They feel forgotten. They feel mistreated. Some have lost relationships. They've lost a job. They've lost multiple things. A family member, a job. They maybe have gotten an eviction notice, God, and they're feeling like, you have forgotten them. Today, today I pray that you would remind your people that there is a king's table and you're inviting them to say yes to you. You're inviting them to say yes to you. And if they will let themselves be found by you, you will elevate them and you will restore them. There's some God who they feel like in their own heart, they are disqualified from relationship with you. They look at their own deficiencies. They look at their own disabilities. They look at their own struggles. But when we say yes to you, to your invitation, to your throne room, and to your table, you welcome us just as we are. I pray right now in homes, in homes and in business places, right now that you would minister that you would reassure them through your Holy Spirit that they are not forgotten, that they are not overlooked, that they have a seat at your table. Reassure your people today. In Jesus' name, amen.